it's an enormous honor and a great pleasure to be um, here in, in Moscow. It's my first time in Russia, and I'm extremely excited about the whole occasion. It's very, very moving for me indeed. And I think, um, overwhelmingly, the message I really want to put across here in Moscow is that um, the directions, some of the directions, at least in which Western theology are now going, are, are very positive um, from the point of view of the Eastern tradition. Um, the immediate background to this paper was that the Journal Modern Theology, were, uh, which is an Anglo-American journal of theology, was a quarter of a century old, and various people um, were asked to reflect on developments in theology um, during that 25 year period. Um, and so this paper was um, what I came up with. And when I wrote the paper, I thought that it was very striking uh, that theology has um, moved through um, a period of great transition. Obviously, the last 25 years uh, in Russia have been a period of enormous transition. Um, and there's nothing quite comparable in the West. And yet, the changes that have happened in Russia um, have, I think, um, impacted upon everybody. And they've coalesced with certain other developments um, as well. And it struck me that there were three um, very uh, important differences between the state for theology now in the West compared, shall we say, to um, the situation back in the 1960s. Um, and I think overwhelmingly that the most significant difference is a difference of context, really. That if one goes back to the post-war era, uh, it was a period of considerable secularization already, rapid secularization. But at the same time, um, religion was quite benignly tolerated. Uh, there was no sense of great opposition to religion. And also there was a feeling that uh, liberal democracy was generally acceptable for everybody. And, and Christians were trying to find a way of accepting liberal democracy, accommodating to liberal democracy. And that was the mood, for example, behind the um, Second Vatican Council. And compared to de with today, particularly perhaps in the United Kingdom, um, that's changed because I think that we're now faced with um, uh, a far more um, militant sort of atheism. Um, and it may even be that the fall of communism has something to do with that, that as long as communism existed and was associated um, with, with atheism, um, the, f the feeling that sort of out-and-out -out atheism was, if you like, in the enemy camp for the West existed. And it, it's notable that since 1990, sort of the militancy of atheism uh, particularly in the United Kingdom, seems to have increased. So that there's a lot of hostility to people speaking in a religious voice in the public realm, um, even uh, 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 um, people feeling that, that religion is simply irrational and, and its place should be minimized as far as possible. But the most famous representative of um, this position, of course, is the biologist Richard Dawkins. And yet at the same time, and, and, and seemingly with enormous paradox, um, one could also say that religion seems to have returned to the public sphere everywhere. Of course, we've got the rise of Islam, we've got the phenomenon of the influence of evangelicalism in the United States. But even in Great Britain, even though church attendance is declining, the incidence of religious people being active in politics is actually increasing. So much so that people of faith seem to be far more successful in securing things like fair wages in London 
than trade unionists are. Um, so perhaps one could say here that even though religion is declining, somehow all secular ideologies, you know, including Marxism, have also declined. And, and somehow in that situation, the people who still call to um, sort of active political transformation often do seem to be um, people of, of religion. And so on the one hand, we have atheism. On the one hand, we have this increased presence of religion in public life. And this means that, if you like, um, the mood of a, a kind of polite agnosticism has rather passed, that somehow the mood has become um, more confrontational, um, uh, less element of people trying to accommodate to secular norms, and a more uh, sort of active debate about the virtues or otherwise of, sec of secularity. And one could also mention here um, things like the manifest difference between secular and Christian attitude when it comes to things like the sanctity of life, um, how you treat the old and the dying, issues like euthanasia and so on, um, whether you believe in the soul, mind, free will at all, that one could say the question of the scientific reduction of human beings is becoming now more of a political issue. And I would also suggest to you that in many ways, Russian thinkers in the past were more sort of prophetic. You know, if one's talking about Dostoevsky or Solovyev, Florensky or Bulgakov, they were all, or Bordaev, they were all much more prophetic of this turn of events in some ways than I think um, people have been um, in, in, in the West. So in the older situation, if one sort of tracks back to the 60s, um, the main theology for most of the 20th century, it seemed to be dominated by German Protestant theology and often dominated by debates um, about whether uh, the narratives of the Gospels were historically credible or not. Um, and the main divide seemed to be between um, Bartian neo-Orthodox Protestant theology on the one hand and um, a more liberal theology on the other hand. And liberal theology seemed to be mainly about demythologizing Christianity and trying to translate it into terms of a contemporary secular culture. Bartian theology um, appeared to be very resistant to that um, and wanted to insist that theology um, is simply about the world of God um, or it's about Christian doctrine, it's about church dogmatics, as Bart entitled um, his sequence on systematic theology. Um, but the, the danger then was that, to a certain extent, theology revolved within its own circle, that um, it was not really um, questioning secular knowledge when it comes to secular philosophy or secular accounts of culture and politics. It was simply denying that that represents any kind of propedeutic to um, theology as such. And one could even go so far as to say that really liberal Protestantism and Bartianism represent two different forms of post-Kantianism. On the one hand, the Bartians are saying, well, um, there's nothing in the sort of imminent enclosure of knowledge that tends towards faith. And on the other hand, the liberals um, were suggesting that um, things like our, our ethical understanding or our aesthetic understanding um, can uh, 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 f form the, the essential language into which the deliverances of um, revelation um, have to be um, translated. And so if now the cultural context is very different, um, I also think the theological context is, is very, very different because somehow the German Protestant legacy was not giving very adequate tools for a critique of secular culture, which now seems to be um, what is required. Uh, on the one hand, you had 
liberal, a liberal theology of mediation. On the other hand, you had a Barthian theology refusing modes of mediation, but not really engaging critically. And now peop what people seem to want is something much more like a mode of critical mediation. And I think that once one has, has said that, one passes on to the, the third shift, um, which is, if you like, both confessional and geographical. Um, we seem to have passed the era, era when theology was dominated both by Protestantism and by um, the German intellectual tradition. Now, this is incredibly ironic because in many ways, if you look you know, around the world, um, it seems to be Protestantism that's growing, for example, in Latin America and, and so on. But often it's, it's growing in a very non-theological way or it's growing in a way amongst people who feel they don't really need theology. And what one finds is that sometimes when people have grown up inside this tradition and start to reflect a bit more and want to engage with the whole of Christian leg legacy, they do um, start to go more in what I'm calling this sort of post-Protestant, pan-Catholic kind of direction. So it's, it's very characteristic now of, shall we say, Protestants in America who are in universities that where sort of 40 years ago they would never have engaged with Thomas Aquinas or the Church Fathers, that they're now much more prepared to admit that this is part of the legacy. And after all, if you're insisting on the authority of the Bible, you don't necessarily stop at the idea that Luther and Calvin are the ultimate authoritative um, interpreters um, of the Bible. And I think that more primarily, somehow it's the Catholic tradition in the broadest sense. Um, by that I mean the entire patristic Orthodox tradition embracing, you know, Orthodoxy, the Roman Catholic Church, um, High Anglicans, everybody who's committed to that tradition. It's, it's more that tradition that is able um, to think in terms of analogical mediation, um, the way in which everything in reality points towards God, but the more you see that it points towards God, um, the more you see everything in a transformed light, in a, in a, in a transfigured light. Um, for various reasons that I've tried just now to set out, it seems to me that the quarrel between liberal theologians and orthodox theologians is now much less to the fore than it was. But I think that the overwhelming reason for that um, is that liberals are simply tending to become agnostics or atheists, that, or they move into religious studies, or they move into a sort of uh, interreligious position, into, into some sort of post-Christian um, position. And, and that has resulted in, in a general weakening of the liberal current in theology. It seems to be more and more true that if, if people in the West still are doing Christian theology at all, it tends to be um, from a creedally orthodox um, standpoint. When I'm using the word orthodox in this talk, I'm meaning it in the sense of creedal orthodoxy, not in the sense of Eastern orthodoxy. Um, so given this um, situation, um, where theology seems to be more and more conducted in an orthodox um, fashion. The new divide um, seems to be characterizable in terms of what I've described probably rather unsatisfactorily, um, a classical orthodoxy on the one hand and a romantic orthodoxy on the other. Um, and by these terms, what I mean primarily is that the classical position, which isn't really classical, but one can call it that in terms of a, a, a term of art. The, the classical position is insisting on the importance of reason within theology, but reason um, taken in a, in, in a rather sort of objectivist, uh, emotionless, um, scientific um, kind of sense. Um, so that this tradition is insisting very much on the importance of rational arguments, 
for the existence of God, um, a rational demonstration of the plausibility and the necessity of revelation, um, a rational account of whether um, revelation is believable um, in terms of uh, the event of miracles um, uh, and, and so on. Um, and then it tends to think of revelation itself um, in terms of a set of revealed propositions that be, can be subject to um, a rigorous rational analysis. Um, and often this kind of approach to theology um, tends to line up with the traditions of Anglo-Saxon analytic philosophy on the one hand, um, and also, I think, with um, a certain acceptance of a kind of liberal capitalist democratic um, modernity on, on the other hand. Um, in, in other words, to some extent, I think it's about how you can be an orthodox Christian and a good American at the same time. Um, and it's, it's partly for that reason that I'm slightly suspicious of, of, of the whole of the whole exercise. Um, and I think that this is overwhelmingly the case because this tradition tends to want a sharp divide between nature and grace. It wants to say that the, the natural discourse about God is, is one thing, but it's quite separate from revelation. It doesn't in any way anticipate um, the advent of grace. Um, which has got to be seen by contrast as a free gift over against um, the work that merely human reason um, can do. And this insistence on, if you like, the autonomy of human reason um, tends to go along with the idea that they want to be reconciled to a strictly secular account of such things as politics and, and economics. And in that sense, it tends to cohere with the sharp American divide between church and state, um, uh, church and state. Um, the tendency, if you like, can take more liberal forms or it can take um, more conservative forms, whether we're talking about ecclesiology um, or about politics. The relatively liberal people want to insist on the autonomy of human reason. They want to say that we can have common ground with non-Christians when it comes to ethical and political issues that the, the same essential arguments about ethics and politics can be made by all human beings, whether they're Christian or not. This would be the kind of way somebody like Karl Rahner um, um, thought about things. And then um, more conservative people tend to take the same position because they want to argue that arguments over things like abortion, for example, can be won strictly in terms of a rational, natural law sort of argument without invoking considerations that derive uh, directly from the New Testament. This would be despite the fact that secular people don't seem to be exercising their reasons in ways that lead towards the same um, conclusions. So there's a sense in which the people I want to call the romantics are resisting both the liberals and the conservatives. And it's definitely this so-called romantic position um, that I would be wanting to advocate. And I would associate such a position with the legacy of the Nouvelle Theology in the history of Catholic theology in the 20th century. So with people like Henri de Lubac, Jean Danielou, Hans Urs von Balthasar. And these people, I think it's very important to say, were very sympathetic to the Greek patristic legacy. Um, they tended to, in my view, rightly deny that this legacy was at, at variance with the legacy that comes um, from Augustine. But they were saying things that are very sympathetic to um, the Eastern Orthodox um, legacy. Um, and I also think that their way of thinking is, is very compatible 
um, with the so-called sophiological tradition um, in, in the Russian legacy. And I also think that one of the most notable things about the Russian intellectual legacy is that it simply hasn't made a, a strong division between philosophy and theology. And this is something I greatly favor. It's part of what the center I running is trying to promote because the church fathers didn't think of themselves as theologians and not philosophers or philosophers and not theologians. They thought that theology was, in a sense, um, Christian philosophy. And it seems to me that somebody like Solovyev is recovering precisely that kind of insight. And therefore, he's not making a sharp separation between nature and grace. But he does uphold the position that by nature, we are orientated to the beatific vision, to the receiving of grace, um, even though we can't demand something that has to be a gift. So you reach the paradox that we can only reach our natural end if we receive something beyond that, our nature, um, as a gift. We can only be ourselves if we receive something that doesn't belong to us. It seems to me that's the paradox um, that lies at, at the very heart of um, Christianity. It goes along with the fact that, first of all, nature is a gift. It's, it's creation. It goes along with the fact that the only fully human being who ever lived was a divine person in, in two natures. It goes along with a strongly Cyriline and in no way Nestorian um, Christology. And it seems to me that it's that unity, that integral unity of nature and grace which lies behind um, the doctrine of deification that people like Henri de Lubac were trying to recover um, in the West. I think they were also trying to argue that that had only been lost in the West perhaps much later than some people on the Eastern side like to think. Um, it's not really lost in Augustine. It's restored in Erigena. It's in many ways recovered yet more in Aquinas, who reads Damascene and, and Dionysus the Areopagite, and so on. That in many ways, what the East tends to regret in, in the West is these are developments, these are later developments that go wrong in the Middle Ages. And I think myself have a lot to do with the Franciscan tradition, then that's a controversial claim um, and not one that I especially want to um, discuss at the moment. But I think it's during the Middle Ages that you start to get this rupture between nature and grace and then you start to get this model of two tiers, the idea that you can consider ethics, politics, our life on earth without any reference to grace or revelation that you can have purely natural arguments for the existence of God that don't depend on any kind of natural um, anticipation um, of the divine gift. And in the long run, that's going to lead to Western ideas of secular autonomy. Um, the idea that we can completely rule ourselves um, without reference to God in certain fields. It's also going to give birth to the idea of philosophy as completely autonomous um, and not as something that's necessarily um, linked towards theology. And ironically, that departs even from the piety of the pagans. You know, even Plato and Aristotle thought that their wisdom was a participation in the wisdom of the divine. So in some ways, this idea of a purely autonomous philosophy um, is a kind of perverse invention of the wrong kind of theology. That's what I would want to claim. And I also think that um, going along with that um, is a divorce between the will and the reason. That this kind of way of looking at things, what I'm calling the classical way of looking at things, um, tends to be over-rationalistic. It tends to think that the will, that reason can be exercised, if you like, in a neutral mood. 
um, in abstraction from the notion of right desiring. If you like, right desiring is the thing that integrates will and reason together. But the more you stress the total independence of the reason, the more you have the notion of will as a kind of anarchic act of pure choice that's not guided by right desiring. You know, the proper Christian view should be that we're only free when we're desiring the good. And we're not really exercising our will freely so long as we're not desiring the good because we're under the control of the less than good. We're under the control of um, evil as privation. We're, we're under the, the control of the demonic, even, if you like, to say that. So I think then that what I'm calling the classical view, the view that has a strong divorce between nature and grace, um, is also um, a view that, that is, has an overly narrow understanding of, of reason, that it doesn't want to see reason as inherently bound up with right desire. It doesn't want to see that we can only exercise our reason after we've made certain assumptions. We can only exercise our reason when we're looking in a certain direction, when we're trying to follow through on certain um, intuitions. And I think that this more, more romantic conception of reason is in line with um, the thinking of the church fathers because um, Christian theology um, is not based on a series of revealed propositions. It's not even in the first place um, based upon a kind of rationalistic elucidation of certain decisions of church councils seen as purely judicial decisions. Obviously, they, there are decisions, and obviously, these have a judicial aspect. Obviously, we can't divorce theology completely from canon law. But on the other hand, we have to remember that the decisions of church councils are attempts to safeguard things um, that up to that point had inhered implicitly in Christian reading and Christian spirituality and Christian practice. The, the legal character, if you like, is, is, is secondary um, to the mysticism and the spirituality and the, the tacit flow of the tradition. It seems to me that this is in keeping with um, an orthodox perspective. And it seems to me, above all, that we have to see that orthodoxy, creedal orthodoxy, is stemming from traditions established by people like Oregon and, and, and Irenaeus. Um, and I mentioned two things in particular. I mentioned the tradition of the spiritual senses and the tradition of the typological or allegorical um, reading of, of Scripture. So that we can't make sense of the doctrines of incarnation or of deification um, unless we have the sense, the idea that in the liturgy our, um, our um, normal physical senses are being raised to um, a perception of something transcendent, something that exceeds them. And the doctrine of the spiritual sense is, some, is something specifically Christian. We're not talking merely about the insights of the soul. We're talking about the insights of soul and body taken together. So the idea that one could also characterize the spiritual life in terms of five senses that one gets in Oregon is, is a sign of this in, integrity of, of, of vision that insists on our corporeality as well as on our spirituality. And I suggested, after many other thinkers, that where the spiritual senses and the fourfold sense of Scripture come together is in the Song of Songs or in the Canticles, which are the most intense, if you like, prophecy of the unity of God with the soul, the unity of um, Christ with the church, and at the same time expressing the spiritual in the most extreme sensual language, indeed um, in an erotic language. And I say a little bit about how I think 
despite some excessive overstatements, exaggerations, exaggeration of the uh, sort of monopoly of this kind of imagery, that I do think that people like de Lubac, von Balthasar, Cardinal Scola, Ratzinger, have been right to say that in the face of the sort of the crisis of gender and sexual relations in our world today, we need, if you like, to insist on the significance of the literal pole of this metaphor. Um, and, and, and clearly we are bound to think more about the nature of marriage as a sacrament, its link to the Eucharist, the importance of the married life um, as a spiritual path, as its own mode of escasis, if you like, alongside um, the, the celibate life. We have now consciously to emphasize um, the role of the feeling, of the imagination, of the aesthetic, even more, more self-consciously, even than the patristic tradition did or the medieval tradition. One can say that all those things were latent in that tradition, but in a way, um, the non-recognition of the full integrity of, of, of human thinking. The fact that, you know, human thinking comes from the heart. And, you know, all this stuff about the spiritual senses and so on in Oregon is a meditation on the biblical centrality of the heart. What one has to say is that somehow this wasn't thought through strongly enough. And, and, and therefore, you know, the possibility of a rationalistic reduction was in a way, never adequately safeguarded against. So that, to my mind, it would be the work of providence, the work of the Holy Spirit, um, that after kind of the excesses of a rationalistic enlightenment, we, we realise much more um, the way reason is linked into feeling and imagination and our, and our sense of beauty and so on. And it's for this reason that I don't think it's any act that the first people to recover an authentic Christian orthodoxy in modern times have usually been artists and literary figures. We have, you know, somebody like Dostoevsky. Um, we have somebody like Gerard Manley Hopkins. We have somebody like Cardinal Newman in some ways. Then we have Claudel and Peggy, or we have J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis um, and Charles Williams um, in, in the British Isles or Dorothy L. Sayers. And in many ways, all these people saw much further than the professional theologians, and the professional theologians have had to um, catch up with them because I think that they grasped that the only way um, to understand the story of a, of a creator God, um, of a God who becomes incarnate, is to grasp it imaginatively, to see... Um, that, that reality itself is, if you like, the greatest possible um, act of imagination, that in the incarnation, it's as if myth and history, as Tolkien put it, are absolutely um, fusing together. It's as if we're in a realm that's neither completely historical nor completely mythical, but is, is both at the same time. So in the end, bound to be um, self-defeating. So it, it's um, for all those reasons um, that I think um, what I'm talking about as the romantic path is, is the way forward. And I think it's this path um, that's much more um, sympathetic with the, the Eastern tradition. Thank you. Thank you.